Today we will not talk about goat-like personality, we will talk about cheap-like personality, aka Bethel. Because believe it or not, I actually served on four different Bethel. Uh, you wouldn't believe it when you see me. <laughs> but including the Russian branch. And I have some really, really, really funny story to tell, several. But um, to tell you about myself, I grew up in a Jehovah's Witness family in Sweden. I was fourth generation Jehovah's Witnesses. And it was more like a clown. So when I came to the congregation uh, where my grandparents live, two thirds of the congregation were my relatives and all of them were elders and pioneers and stuff like that. So I, it was a clan and it was really, really, really witness clan. So that's my culture. That's how I grew up. And that's a lot of nice stuff happened. And when, when you're like in uh, that kind of environment, you don't expect you kind of have realistic expectations to the organization. You not like I notice people, you know, like converts. They go and say, "Oh, it's a spiritual paradise," and then they get dis disappointed. Disappointed. Uh, when you grow up, fourth generation, you're told by the third generation and second what to expect and how to deal with human imperfection, which is a normal thing in any organization. So I remember my dream was to work as a construction worker uh, for the society. And that's, I also got an education, like learn how to be a sheet metal worker. I lo like working with crafts and stuff like that. And sheet metal work is actually, you know, I can make pots and pans and it's, it's really fun. I enjoy it. <laughs> but my long time career goal was to work for the society and build their real estate stuff until Armageddon comes and maybe kill me. But that was my goal. And I was really, really looking forward to that. And I remember one of my uncles, he's an elder and one of the society's troubleshooter. He said, you know, you're really doing the right thing. You're really doing the right thing. The society say you should not have an education, not even if your plan is to work for the society, but, uh, you're doing the right thing. It's better with an education. And he said, you know, he, he took me up, apart from the other ones who were alone. And he said, you know, when I started in full-time service, a man took me apart from the other uh, uh, experienced brother and gave me three advices. And when he said this, I thought he's an apostate, but I decided to listen to the advice. And it's a very good advice. So I'm going to give it to you now. And he said, First, never ask for permission. If you want to do something, do it without asking the society. Because you might get no. And then he said, learn to use the system, learn to work the system. Because if you've never been a Jehovah's Witness, I have to explain this, it's an organization. It's not a church, it's an organization, basically a printing company, but there's like rules and loopholes for everything. And as any system, you can take a little advantage of that. He said, learn to work within the system and learn to work the system to your benefit. And third advice, most important of all, never ever trust Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. So that's the advice I got from my uncle. And he's, he was an elder, he's still an elder. And obviously my first thought was, Apostate, apostate, my uncle's an apostate. I have to report him. And then I just realized he would deny everything. And I have no second witness. You see what he did? He took me. <laughs> so he's working the system and it actually works. Not even the Holy Spirit can disfellowship an apostate as long as there's not two witnesses. So this is powerful shit. So it, it's, a, it's a good advice. If you're a witness uh, watching this, it's actually good advice. Never ask for permission, learn to work the system, and never ever trust Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. So that was my, my general idea of how to work at Bethel. And this uncle of mine, he also been a Beth, they've been, my family's ah, a really, really, really spiritual family, you know? <laughs> if you if you, we don't have blood we have watched our ink you know <sighs> in our veins so anyway my dream was to work in construction and we were working in russia 
the Russian battle open. I really wanted to go there. And you had to be 20 years old. And I thought I could make work my way through that because I actually came into construction sites before that. I was only 16 years old through nagging, 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 nagging. Because if you, if you talk to witnesses, even high ranking watchtower guys, you can basically get anything from nagging as long as you remind them of scriptures without reminding them. So they, rem you put them in their head. So I, I basically called them three times a day until they started thinking about the, um, the judge and the widow and the widow was nagging and they started feeling more and more like the, the, the judge. So I came to the first construction like that. We had a lot of fun. It was in Strangness. But then I wanted to rush in. I thought, okay, I can do this. I started nagging, 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 nagging. It didn't work. I was nagging and nagging and nagging and working all my networking all didn't work. So in the end I said, okay, I moved to Norway. And then I started nagging at the Norwegian branch. Also didn't work. And then all of a sudden I got an invitation from an elder in Sweden. And remember when you get an invitation to work at Russian battle from an elder in Sweden, it's not valid. <laughs> But, I, but still, I had an invitation. So then I called to the Norwegian branch and said, you know, good, good day, brother, love, 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 Jehovah, Jehovah, blah, blah, blah. And you know, Jehovah has answered my prayers. I've been richly blessed. I got an, I got an invitation to work in Russia, finally. But you know, there's one thing. Due to human imperfection, this invitation come from Sweden, not Norway. And I'm a pioneer in Norway, so I don't want to mention this to anyone because I don't want to stumble anyone due to things like this might happen. But maybe you could just fix this and give me a Norwegian invitation. And, and the brother battle said, yeah, yeah, of course I fixed that. So he printed out a Norwegian invitation for me. <laughs> so then I was invited to Bethel in Russia, even though I was only 19 and the current age limitation for temporal workers were 20. I think so. I don't remember the age. But anyway, I got the invitation that way. <laughs> so I went to Russia, was first in Finland and then in Russia, and they had it lined up very well. So you came there and there's like one guy inviting you and you get a helmet. I got a helmet and we printed my name in Swedish name, but in Russian alphabet. You will not use that zoom. <laughs> and the show was around and they had a, it was very well organized, believe it or not. And they show us this is Varasto. Varasto means warehouse, and you get five, five dollars, uh, Bethel dollars, basically a token. So if you want to have one tool, you give them one dollar. The second tool, one dollar. But if you need more uh, tools, you have to leave in one. You can't just take all the tools. So it's they had a very line up system, and they had a working system for health and you know security, also very well. It's a lot of good stuff. Uh, one other thing I really liked was uh, they called it toolbox meeting. That means that every week we got one hour to discuss something that's potentially dangerous and we could do it whenever we wanted. So I'm working outside because I'm a sheet metal worker. So, and obviously my team was doing the same. So if it was raining or bad weather, they said, okay, we'll take the meeting now. And then this week we will talk about letters. And then we spoke about letters for half an hour. And that's a good thing, having, you know, focus on security. And the next time it was loose cables. So they had a system and that was very good. It's important when you have hundreds of uh, people working on top of each other. So it was a lot of thing that was good. So when they had this introduction, they show us around. And they were always saying, you know, you put your bottles you don't put your bottles in the trash, put them behind, besides the trash. And they always mention that. Don't, and there's a rule for this, there's a rule for that, but you can do whatever you want in your room. And there's a rule for this, there's a rule for that, but you can do whatever you want in the room. Everyone said that you can do, every time they explain one of the rules and regulations, you can do whatever you want in the room. And put your bottles, not in the trash, behind the trash. <laughs> I heard it. <laughs> On every station they said that. So. So I was working and you note, noticed something was wrong. 
it wasn't, you know, the loving atmosphere. People were... T when fin when it opened up, the Bethel in Sweden, no, uh, Brooklyn, they said, you know, we put this in charge, the Russian Bethel in charge of the Finnish brothers. And the Swedish were like, why? Don't they know Sweden rules Scandinavia? And it was like, imagine they would open up the work in India and they would put... Uh, the French battle in charge of India, the British would be, what, 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 what's happening? We are in charge of of, <laughs> of India. And the same with with uh, the Swedes. They were a bit arrogant, they didn't know it themselves, but due to historical reasons, they just assumed that we will be in charge of Russia because we used to invade them, and they used to invade us. But... Um, Finland was in charge, so the Finnish started doing things. First, they built a big sauna and put up a fence. And then the Swedes started coming. And the Finnish were like, and now the Swedes are coming and they just assumed that they will be in charge of everything. And then the Swedish brother came, well, now we have arrived, please put us in charge of everything. <laughs> so you had that thing going on. And then it came more and more uh, European nations, but it was basically most Swedes, Danes, most Scandinavians and some French and German other people were working there all together. And then it came the, you know, Russians and from all of old Soviet. And then you get the cultural difference directly, not only the language and that, but you think the Scandinavians, we were third or fourth generation. So we were came there expecting human imperfection. Why the converts, they couldn't speak English often, and we couldn't speak Russian. And they were expecting a spiritual paradise. <sighs> and so it was actually not a nice atmosphere. It was like bickering, and you could see, you could feel something was wrong. And you could see the Russians, they were like this really nice, but you could feel something's wrong. They couldn't put a finger on it. And I felt something was wrong and I felt maybe this is why Jehovah sent me here because I've been on different sites. I knew all the rules. I knew all the loopholes. And even if it's a well-organized place, it's nothing wrong with that. But also you can spread some joy. I'm that kind of person that I find happiness everywhere and I try to spread it. So I was walking around telling jokes and and, you know, without breaking any of the battle rules, there's a lot of stuff you can do to spread optimism. And also try to encourage the Russians, kind of make them lower their expectations. And then in, uh, in the weekends, we would go out in field service. The field service in Russia was fun because Russians, they really like culture. They really read and opera and stuff like that. So Russians would always walk around with a book in their hand. And as soon as they were on a train or something, they were standing in the bus, a bus full of 100 Russians, that's 100 people reading a book. So if you gave them, when I gave them a Watchtower magazine, they would often pick it up and start reading directly. So it was fun. We had a lot of fun. And Russia in the 90s, it was still like communist. Well, Russia never had communism. They had state capitalism. It's a big difference. But... State capitalism, that means the government's running a big business. So the government making the food, transporting the food, selling the food with no competition. So they got used to not putting up signs. Here is food because there were no competition. So people will find us. And also if they did put up a sign, it was in Russian. And most of the Scandinavians can't read it. I know Russian, but most of them don't. So... And I remember we were at the field service, and then if you wanted to find a story, you had to ask people, and they would show where you were. You can find signs, everything. So imagine a big city big like New York with no signs and no windows. To You can't do window shopping, no windows. Just a city with no signs, never. And my friend, he eventually needed to go to a toilet, and he couldn't find anything. And <laughs> so walking around, and he, he, he don't even speak English, I think. And then... He saw a guide, you know, a city guide, and he went to her and said, oh, panic, panic, I need, I need now, I need now. He pointed, you know, I need now. And, uh, ooh. and she was looking at him and said, ah, I understand. And she, she grabbed him by the hand and she walked him over to a different street and said, here, 
is where you can find the prostitutes. <laughs> That's a big misunderstanding. And he actually cracked his pants. <laughs> I won't say his name. No, it was fun. The field service was fun. We're out. And we also had, we had working visas, not tourist visas. Because back then, if you would go, Russians really love culture. And it was ridiculously cheap. So if you would go to a museum there, they would say $50. But if we went there, we just show we had a working visa. So we would pay the same as a Russian. And then it was like, one nickel and you're in. So, <laughs> some, way, some way of the Scandinavian brothers, they were really smart and they took advantage of it. They used to go to symphony orchestra and opera and just pay 10 cents, prices like that. I used to, I used to, when out field service, I used to buy kebab, shavermo, because all of a sudden I couldn't afford that because the prices were so literally low. And I was still a teenager and I was just eating and eating and eating. And all the brothers said, you can't eat in Russia. It's the Russian bacteria is so terrible. We can't eat in Russia. And I was just eating and eating. I never got sick. They told me, you get sick, you can't eat anything in Russia. It's so much bacteria. It's so terrible. So I never got sick. I thought it's because my stomach is used to it because I was pioneering. And when I was pioneering, it was not like now they're standing by a cart playing Angry Birds. I was living in my car, I was eating stuff I would find in, in the fjord. And uh, I remember once in a convention, I had no food, I, I found beetles, you know, beetles with a, big beetles with a long leg. I ate them at the convention and one of them got stuck here and he started to climb up. <laughs> I actually panicked. It's really weird when something's climbing inside your throat. <laughs> anyway, so I... I used to go, I was a field service, we eating kebab. I never got sick. And now I actually believe that this Russian bacteria they always talk about, it was just an excuse for every time they ate something on battle, the brothers, they washed it down with vodka due to the bacteria. <laughs> there was a lot of drinking. And so I was working all day. And then, you know, I was young, so I, I, you don't get tired when you're that age. So we're working long days and then in the evening I would go out by the, uh, the Baltic Sea. It, the, the Russian battle it's just by the sea. It's a great location if you think about from a, a real estate developing point of view. So if they wanted to sell it, they could sell it as a, some kind of school, hospitals. The Russian state own it now, they're going to use it as a hospital. That's a good thing. But we, we build this you know, Bethel, it's like a lot of hotel, dorm houses, and then you have a school, like a school and restaurants and stuff. You can use it to, uh, you can sell it to people that want to use it for educational purposes, university or a hospital. They say it's going to be a hospital now, and that's good. They support that. Anyway, it's a beautiful place by the, by the sea. I used to go out walking every day try to meet people or some girls flirting with me, but I don't know how to flirt. I'm a witness boy. So I would ask them questions, you know, why do God permit the evil? And they would try to answer and I'm trying to speak Russian. And, and in the end, they gave me an address to an Orthodox church and I say, maybe they can answer your questions. <laughs> I was terrible at flirting. Uh, anyway, so I was in Bethel trying to, uh, uh, trying to, we work within the system and make people, you know, spread some joy, make people understand it doesn't have to be grim, you know, Jehovah is a happy God. And people started telling me, don't laugh, this is Bethel. And I said, okay, so it's starting to work, you know. I thought they were joking, telling me a joke, you know. Don't laugh, this is Bethel, like gallow humor. Don't laugh, this is Bethel. So I'm trying to spread some joy, but it was was hard you, you know all these russians coming there and expecting a spiritual paradise and i tried to explain well you know human imperfection lower your standards while i came there with already low standards like human imperfection you believe that the watchtower organization is god's organization it's like 99 percent human imperfection and a slightly divine spark somewhere uh, and still from that perspective <laughs> You can't even find the spark. And 
you know when witnesses really harass each other like you can't do this because it's wrong but you can't do this because it looks like you're contemplating something wrong and you can't do this because it looks like you're contemplating doing something that might stumble someone and you can't do it you can't do this because it looks like you're contemplating this even though it's not wrong and a way to survive in the system is to bully other before they bully you and and some of the things in like we take for granted like you know when you're mopping floor that's some of the russian sisters came there they never seen that before so they just took them up and they were standing on their knees scrubbing the floor and people were stressed because of the constant bullying of each other and the sisters would scream the finnish sisters would some of them would scream at the russian sisters are you stupid why can't you do this real of course they couldn't do it they never seen a mopping thing before they were standing on their knees like their grandmothers used to do and everyone was trying to complain at someone else before someone complained at me it was so stressful <laughs> And I started feeling not like I wasn't depressed, but the same feeling as depression. You feel something's wrong and you're smiling because this is Bethel. Good day, good day, Jehovah, 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 Jehovah. And they smile to you and you can just look in their eyes like, help me, something's wrong. And I know all the rules, you know, you have the Old Testament, New Testament, you have Bible principles, you have love, you have the Watchtower directions and you try to align all of them and none of them is right. And then you see the people that actually enjoying themselves. They are, you know, the career Bethelites that, that, you know, oh, Watchtower Direction. And that's all I need to know. Bible, no, nope. Watchtower Direction. Culture, Watchtower Direction. And they were also fighting, you know, the Swedes and the Finns. Not like fighting, fighting, but you have this, for historical reason, uh, bickering and... So the Swedes wanted to do this the Swedish way, according to the Swedish building code. While the Finnish wanted to do it the Finnish way. And I said, you know, we have to do it the Russian way. Because we're in Russia. It's Russian legislation. No, 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 no. Jehovah put us in charge. No, he put us in charge. So we do it the Finnish way. And they also start, started behaving. Don't read too much into it, but... It was really sad when we were sitting and the Russian weren't present, the Scandinavians and the Europeans, they started behaving, uh, talking about Russian people like we were some kind of colonial power. Uh, if someone farted, they would say, it smells Russian. They would say stuff like that. The, uh, and that's not cool, but that happened a lot. Uh, <laughs> don't read too much into it. It's not like it was a racist thing, but it was not cool stuff they said and this was and i'm just going there trying to spread some joy and without thinking highly of myself and not ex ex always assume that i'm wrong even though you see everything is wrong and trying to good, do something good without complaining and focus on the positive yes this is spiritual paradise uh, it was so stressful i remember i even woke up in the night for me, I was lying in my bed and I was saying loud, this is a wonderful place, this is a wonderful place, this is a wonderful place. <laughs> because you have the pressure always keeping telling everyone this is a wonderful place. And I remember one time we were sitting and some Scandinavians, uh, you know, all the third and fourth generation witnesses, uh, you know, making fun of the converts, you know, they come here and believe it's a spiritual paradise. <laughs> well, they are in for a lesson. And they pointed at the sisters. They would, you know, if you see in a hotel, they drive around a small cart with, you know, cleaning cart. And they said a lot of the sisters, young Russian sisters, they are depressed because they didn't know about all the drinking, you know. The converts they didn't know about the drinking they expected it uh, and they actually had to build a special box on this cart with closed walls so you can't see what's inside because it's if you ever been on Bethel it's all about appearance you have to even to visit Bethel they will ask you to wear a certain kind of clothing 
even as a visitor. So they had to build a special box to keep the vodka bottles in. And a lot of the sisters cleaning room were depressed over this. And we were laughing at them and I was laughing and then I felt, this is wrong. Why are we laughing of the fact that they are depressed? And I looked at the sisters uh, driving those cart and you could just see the pain because they were driving a cart of empty vodka bottles in a, a special wooden box so no one would know it and they know every time they hit a threshold it will make a clinking sound and someone would verbally abuse them for bringing reproach to Jehovah's name and then from a witness perspective I thought you know they they thought imagine when they got invited you know I'm invited to work at Bethel what a privilege what a privilege and you know oh, spiritual spiritual Jehovah Jehovah blah 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 and they were so happy and then they came and started cleaning their room and they say Maybe there was a party last night because of all the bottles. Because that's why you were not allowed to put the bottles in the trash. Because when they came to a room to empty the trash, they had to empty bottles every day, but trash once a month. <laughs> so this is, they were depressed. And I felt sorry for them because I realized they feel the same as I do. And now, after leaving the cult, I, you know, I feel even worse for them because they could have spent their youth getting an education or starting a family or something. Instead, they were verbally abused for the fact that vodka, empty vodka bottles clink when you hit an old Soviet threshold with a cleaning cart with small wheels <sighs> feel really and I actually felt bad imagine a depressed I wasn't depressed I'm a very happy person but you know it's like a stress building up and you can see the stress and I'm trying to trying to I knew all the rules I thought I knew all the rules there was one rule I didn't know uh, I was not Bethelite technically I was just working as a um, uh, con temporary worker and, well, they told me I should stay there for Armageddon or something like that. But so I didn't have my own place to sit in the Bethel cafeteria, you know. So you have to come early and you have to stand and look, feel critical and smile. And then they say just like one minute before prayer, there's a free spot here and you will sit there. And then you do the prayer and blah, blah, blah. And then eat and then you pass the food around. So I started to pass the food around and oh. So it goes this way, okay, no big deal. I didn't think about it. And then the next room, uh, and I never understand it, you know, sometimes we would pass this way and that, and no one explained it to me, and, you know, it's not a big deal. So I was, okay, no, that. That's all that happened. I tried to pass potatoes the wrong way. <laughs> I never understood that, but it's an important thing later. So it was stressful. And I felt something was wrong. And in the end, I could just put all my thoughts into one sentence. And it felt so good to say it. Because it was true. And you didn't want to, work, to be true. But I had to say, this is a place with no love. This is a place with no love. Everything you do, you're under scrutiny all the time. And everyone's attacking other people while smiling. Don't do that. Someone might be stumbled. And the reason why people were drinking was because after working, you need to relax. And vodka was cheap and available. And then I started to realize this rule. You can do whatever you do in your room. That was a real rule. They did not care as long as you don't damage the brand. So I'm going to tell you a story. It's a sad story. It's a story about true Christian love. So it was drinking all the time, but you didn't see anything. People were carrying, you smuggled the bottles into your room and then you drink it and you put it by the trash and the depressed Russian sisters take them out. I didn't drink. Like I said, I was young and not tired, out walking all day. But I remember we were always pressured to work and work and work. 
and I remember once I was feeling real. This was in the summer. It was really, really hot. Russia gets extremely hot in the summer. It was really hot, but I was feeling bad. I had the flu. So I went to the nursery and talked to the nurse and she said, you can't stop working because you have the flu. They were always guilt tripping us to work more. And the nurse said, she was a professional nurse, but she said, you can't stop working because you, because you have the flu. I have the flu. I'm still working. <laughs> no one told her how disease spread, <laughs> but her job was basically to tell sick people to keep on working. So I went down to said, okay, I'm going to work. And I just felt like crap. And I went to my bed and fall asleep. And you know, you dream these really vivid dreams, you know, when you have fever. Then I woke up and I was living together with five uh, Finnish brothers. And they were also under the weather and they were smart enough to not work. So I asked them, should we do something? I can go up to the kiosk. And they wanted vodka and another one wanted whiskey. And, and we went up to the kiosk and we were, I think we bought five bottles of vodka, one bottle of whiskey. And the f Finnish brother, they came along, he bought one piece of chocolate. And I remember thinking, why are you buying chocolate? That's not healthy. So we got six bottles of booze. Okay, I normally, this was the only time I did it. But now we bought vodka. And we went to a room and we start playing cards. And the funny thing with Russian vodka bottles, you don't open them like this. You open them like this. Because why would you drink less than a bottle when you open it? So we were sitting there drinking, we have a lot of fun. It was actually a really, really, really good memory. We had, we were sitting there and you know, no stress, nothing, just sitting the whole day playing cards. I can't remember being drunk. I can absolutely can't remember being drunk, but I can remember I was laughing all the time and speaking Finnish came naturally to me. And I don't speak Finnish. So I was probably drunk. I was 19 year old and we, and we drank all the bottles. It was, I don't recommend doing this on a daily basis, but I did it once and uh, I was 19 and it was really, really fun. And the next day we went to work. When you drink uh, vodka, you don't get a hangover. That's a good thing if it's good quality vodka. So the next day we felt wonderful and went to job like nothing, but that was actually a nice memory. So that was the only time I drank there, but like I said, you remember the garbage? The day after there were six empty booze bottles and one piece of chocolate paper. So that's why they don't want to mix it, because they could empty the trash once a year, but they had to empty <laughs> the bottles <laughs> they had to remove every day. So. But we did this in the quarter and no one cares what you drink as long as you can do whatever you want in the room. There's a rule for this, rule for this, don't do that, don't do that, and someone might be stumble, this is battle, don't laugh, this is battle. But you can do whatever you want in the room. And I have a friend who was Norwegian, uh, several friends of mine, and they were drinking together. And one of them drank so much that he lost control of all of his limbs. He was laying on the floor he peed himself he he made number two everything he was just lying on the floor and one of the brothers uh, undressed him and had to walk because they didn't have uh, toilet uh, anything in the room so i had to take one piece of clothing at a time going out clean it in the sink pretending like nothing taking it home cleaning, clean the floor, going back and forth. He could have just opened the door and publicly look shamed this guy and getting a lot of Bethel credits like the guy who pointed finger at someone else, but he spent the whole evening cleaning him, cleaning a drunk Bethelite, clean, cleaning a drunk Bethelite and washing away his shit so that's what I call true Christian love. But it, it wasn't, it was an, it was kind of eating me up inside and I'm trying to encourage the Russians to lower the standards, lovingly reminding the Scandinavians that we are not supposed to 
refer to the Russian brothers as stupid and smelly, trying to explain to elders why it's not illegal to laugh. And the Bible, it was like a stress. And then one day, uh, the, it's, it's, it was really, being on Bethel in Russian is one of the worst experience in my life and the best because the Russian brothers were so nice. I really loved them. And they were suffering. You could just see the pain in their eyes. It was so weird. And the Russian sisters were treated like shit. And they were making fun of them. <laughs> they were making... They were making fun of the fact that they were depressed for driving around empty vodka bottles. It was so weird. And you knew something was wrong. And you're taught to always think that it is my fault. But you know, it's, you can't deny it. Everything is wrong. You come in there, you, you have this realistic view of the society, like 99% human imperfection and one divine spark, and you can't find a divine spark. And you still try to do mental gymnastic to blame yourself. And then they took me aside and said, you can't be here. And I said, why? And I was accused of some stuff I didn't do, literally did not do, that I had been cursing and throwing stuff around, kicking furniture and literally a lie. And then, and, and they said, and also, you have been laughing. And I say, it's nothing wrong with laughing. And I try to explain, I, no, 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 you can't be here. I have to send you home. And, and there's also the other problem. You have been sending stuff the wrong way at the dinner table. And later people uh, explained to me what happened on Bethel. You do the prayer and everything and no one's allowed to eat. Then you have a Bethel elder. And then he do like this. And that means we're going to send it around this, this way. And the next day, maybe he do this or this. We never know. It's his decision. But you're not allowed to eat until he points finger what direction. That's not a really big deal. And no one had explained this to me. That's the reason why I did the crime of, oh, no, okay. <laughs> so obviously I felt like shit, you know, being sent home. It was my life goal to be on Bethel. You feel worthless, like being fired from any job. But then he also said that, We've been working, it was like 600 people working there for four years, five years, something. And they said, we have doing this for so and so many years. We never had any problem with anyone before you. And that was not necessary to say. Because I was leaving anyway. They said, you know, three weeks, uh, th uh, four days from now, there's uh, Iveco going to Helsinki. And we want you to be on that. But he said there was no one, never any problem any time with anyone before you and you know it hit me like a ton of bricks because you're trained to always think that everything is your fault so i hadn't been depressed it's just been this terrible feeling of something's wrong and then you get this punch that everything's your fault it was like an instant depression and i was instantly suicidal and i just knew i can't kill myself because it will bring reproach to jehovah's name which in that case was a good thing. I felt so bad. And I was depressed for at least half a year after that. It was instant depression. Because you believe, I you, I knew it's not my fault, but I, they told me that everything, and why would someone, obviously he was lying. Obviously, imagine 600 witnesses drinking and obviously someone committed a crime of sending food the wrong direction before. I don't know why he actually had to say that to a young man that trained to believe everything here because it was obviously a lie. But I thought I destroyed Jehovah's organization. And I felt like shit. And later I told someone about this and that I felt suicidal but I couldn't kill myself on Bethel because it would bring reproach to Jehovah's name. And they actually said, he was talking about a different project, but I know this story is true. I fact-checked it. He said, there was a guy here 
that wanted to kill himself. We caught him in the act and stopped him. So we sent him home because we couldn't, we, he couldn't kill himself on, on the Watchtower construction site. It would bring direct reproach to Jehovah's name. So we, and he actually said, we sent him home so he could kill himself in his home congregation, which I know for a fact he did. So it was not a loving organization. Okay, let's not read too much into this story. I know it's true, but probably they tried to help him in one way or another. But I know the story is true and that's the way they told me. So I was really depressed. And I always, years and years and years after, I always wonder why, because Bethel is, uh, dinner is a ritual. You're, there's prayer and do, 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 a lot of ritual. And then after all of it, you still have to wait for the battle elder to do hmm. or hmm, before you can start eating. And I couldn't understand it has no function until I got a dog. When you have a dog, you give them food, you put the food in front of them and you teach them that they are not allowed to eat before you say eat or now or something. Because a dog should know that you're the boss. It's not allowed to eat until you tell. And that's the re actually the thing they were doing on Bethel. That's really creepy. There's no other reason. They could always send clockwise or they could always send the opposite. Or this month we do. It's just that authority. A reminder of you're not allowed to eat before we say so. That was actually creepy. So I was really depressed. I felt really sorry for the sisters. I have a, this experience of being on Bethel in Finland and Russia is the worst experience of my life. But I wouldn't be without it because the Russian brothers were so nice. You can see these really honest, truth-seeking people and you can just see their eyes, their souls screaming, <laughs> something's wrong, <laughs> something's wrong with this organization. But it's probably me. And you just wanted to explain them, you know, please lower your standards 99%. But you also know that that's not enough, because that's what I did as a fourth generation witness. And I feel like crack too. I can't see the 1% that's supposed to be divine. So that was Russian Bethel. And we had a lot of fun. No, actually, we didn't have a lot of fun, but... I'm an optimist, so I, I can find funny stuff everywhere. <laughs> there was one, one brother who was funny. He was, he was always, he was absolutely bold like me. And every day he would fill up a glass of honey and eat after dinner. And he was sweet like honey. <laughs> I, I tried to talk to him. He spoke Russian. I, oh, difficult to explain. He was a nice guy. Anyway, someone told me that when, when you're walking like this in Russia, when you have a suit and a tie, like smart dressed, but your clean shaved head, that's in, well, at least back then it was, that means you're connected with mafia if you're smart dressed. But so maybe that's why I deliver so much magazine, you know. You want to live? Read Watchtower. Yes, please. <laughs> I delivered, you could easily deliver 100 magazines on a Saturday. So, I have to start and stop with something positive. No, it was weird. It was really weird. And when I came home from battle, I was so depressed and still feeling suicidal. I was pioneering. And uh, the elders said, you know, how was Russia? I said, it was terrible. And they say, no, they say, you can't say that you have to tell everyone it's a spiritual paradise and you have to encourage young people to make it their lifetime goal to serve at Bethel. I said, it wasn't a spiritual paradise. You're not allowed to say that. You must say it's a spiritual paradise and convince people to do it their lifetime goal to serve at Bethel. And I never did because I never lied. I tried to wrap it in and say, you know, Bethel is an opportunity to learn about human imperfection and our reactions, blah, 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 blah. But I never said it's a spiritual paradise or encourage young people to start working there because it was really, really, really bad. <laughs>